Hi and welcome back to a new video. This video is about the current happenings about the Intel 13 and 14th gen CPUs regarding stability issues, which has been a thing that has been going on for a long time already. I also found out about this a couple of months ago when people started reaching out to me and pointed me towards stability issues on these CPUs. And it's not like I didn't want to do a video about it, I just didn't have anything yeah, productive to add to the subject. Because even when people reach out to me and even if somebody would have provided a CPU to me, there is only a limited amount of things I can do with it. So if I have a CPU that's not stable, then I still can't figure out why it's not stable. And then if I would reach out to Intel, they would have probably just told me to send it to RMA and that's it. So I just didn't have anything uh, proper to add to the subject and that's why I didn't make a video about it yet. But now we have statements from Intel about it. I also strongly recommend to watch the previous two Gamers Nexus video about it because they add a lot of background info. Definitely strongly recommend it to watch those videos first. And now that we have statements from Intel, there is definitely some things I want to add also from technical perspective regarding the oxidation and also my view about the statements and yeah, some problems I have with the things that have been said and things that are from my perspective still missing. In the previous weeks and months, those issues just kept increasing and increasing. And the issue, at least for me and probably also for Intel was that it's not only one specific SKU, like one specific CPU, it was multiple generations like 13th and 14th, which are very identical, that's probably why, and also different scenarios. So I can imagine even from Intel perspective, it was not so easy to track down the issue. Now with the Intel statement, we know that there have been two issues. The one is the oxidation that also Steve reported about, and the second one is a stability issue regarding voltage, which we will get to later. First, I want to talk about the oxidation, which is also called a more specific a via oxidation. A via is a connection between metal layers or specific layers within the CPU. Those vias are responsible for connecting the entire CPU with each other. For example, a current Intel 7, like a 14900K, is made out of about 15 metal layers. So on the bottom, you have the silicon wafer, then on top, you're building up the CPU basically in layers. So like the bottom layer are the transistors, and then above, you have about 15 metal layers connecting the CPU and the transistors with each other. So on top you have the 1700 contact pins as pin out to the socket and then it's like getting smaller and smaller and smaller downwards until you have like billions of transistors that are connected with each other with those different metal layers. And that's for both the data and also the power supply. And for most of the CPUs, all those layers are made out of copper. For Intel 7, I know that the bottom, the smallest layers are also made from cobalt, which is not really, not really relevant for this case, just to add it to be technically correct. But all the other metal layers are made from copper and all the connections in between the vias are also made from copper. To create the via, and that's not only for via, but also for traces generally inside the CPU, like copper connections. So you, you already have your silicon wafer and on top you build up transistors and like a, co a cobalt layer. And then you come to the first um, copper layer, for example. And then you want to connect this with more layers on top. So you start adding another silicon layer on top. And there you have your photoresist and then you etch away one part where you want to create your via. And that's where it starts to become interesting because in theory, then it's quite easy. You have to add some silicon oxide, for example, or silicon nitride to first insulate the silicon itself from the copper because otherwise you would basically create like a shortcut somewhere, short circuit, that's what you don't wanna have. That's why you first have to insulate it with typically silicon oxide. And then you add tantalum nitride, which is uh, required as a diffusion barrier, so your copper stays where it has to stay, and also because the copper can stick much better to the tantalum nitride than it does to, for example, um, the silicon oxide. But you have to keep in mind that at this point you already have copper underneath. That means whatever you're doing above might already directly or indirectly influence the copper layer that is sitting underneath. So you have to be very careful while processing that you don't really impact the copper layer underneath. Because once you have the tantalum nitride in there and you want to start uh, depositing 
copper. That's what you would typically do with atomic layer deposition. That's also what Steve briefly explained in his video, which is basically that you add a precursor into the system that you can imagine this like a gas that contains copper. And then you add a plasma, which results in the copper being deposited evenly across the surface in a very exact layer. And that's like the seeding layer it's called. It's like a first layer that's first deposited. And on this, you would then start with like electroplating, for example, to fill in the gaps and voids and like the via with additional copper to just close off the via, close off the surface or like the trace. Now the thing is, when you do that, you have like your hole where you have like the coating on the side, like the silicon oxide, tantalum nitride, and then you have the exposed copper underneath. And then you want to start using the ALD process to add more copper. That means when you start to use additional gases or like clean it with water, for example, and you have also plasma in there, the plasma and the high temperature could cause to split up, for example, water into hydrogen and oxygen and then causing the copper to oxide, oxidize, which is sitting underneath. So it's very complex and critical process and it's kind of common and I would say easy that something goes wrong there. It's also a very well documented failure method in the semiconductor industry. So this is, this is not something special that never happened before. I think this is like a common process failure that can happen in the semiconductor industry. And the oxidation just generally describes oxygen atoms interacting with copper, then forming copper oxide or like copper dioxide, which then again results in having a layer or a material that is much less conductive than the copper you would have. And typically, if you just think of a, of a wire, that's something you don't really care about. But inside a CPU via or like traces where you go down to a few nanometers size, like some trays could be maybe 20 or 30 nanometers in size, then it's definitely crucial if some parts of this trays are forming an oxide and then reducing the area that can be used as a very conductive part. This oxidation becomes a problem when we take a look at electromigration, which is a phenomenon I'm sure you heard about. And that's basically electrons causing metal atoms to move and drift away inside this very tiny conductor or like a void, mainly caused by the current. So the main influence is the current and also the current density. So how big is your, um, the area of where it occurs? And then the impulse transfer of the electrons are causing the material to move. And this is basically yeah, caused by, as I said, the current and also the current density. There are also other factors uh, such as uh, the voltage and the temperature, but those are like secondary factors because, uh, for example, the voltage will not directly cause or increase the electron migration, but it will, for example, increase uh, the current, which then again increases the electron migration itself because you have to think about it like Ohm's law. If it's a piece of copper and then it has the same resistance and you increase the voltage, it will also increase the current, which is why the voltage or increased voltage will also increase the electromigration, but not like as a primary act, but like a secondary act. The same goes for the temperature. The temperature increases the mobility of the copper atoms, which then allows the electrons to push the copper atoms easier than it usually is at a lower temperature. And then again, if you think about the, yeah, the whole CPU again from the Ohm's law perspective with the same resistance, temperature change also changes the resistance of the part, which then, for example, changes also again the power draw of the part. This means that going back to the oxidation, if, for example, half of your via is oxidized and only half of the via is a good conductor, it will just double the electromigration effect on the via because there's just not much material and then it just increases aging by a lot. And that's probably what happened on the 13th gen CPUs because of the oxidation that didn't fully break the part initially because Intel obviously tests the parts before they are shipped out, but this kind of accelerated aging then happened back at the customer. And that is probably what happened with the 13th gen CPUs. There's a quite interesting article out of the Journal of Electronic Materials from last year that describes this whole thing in much more detail and even visualizes this. They compared two vias that are here marked as TSV, which means through silicon via, with a diameter of about 10 micrometers. And that could be quite a lot compared to the small structures in a CPU. 
One of the vias was exposed to current for 20 days at 200 degrees Celsius. That's the one that is marked left in the image. And the one on the right was not exposed to current. And you can already see right here that there is a difference just looking at the crystal structure of the copper itself. On the right side, we have a pretty nice looking crystal structure of the copper. And on the left side, you could already see the result of the electromigration. We will now take a closer look at the blue marked section of the VIA. Heavily magnified under the scanning electron microscope, we can see the nice copper structure on the left, marked as CUTSV. And on the right side, you can see, surprisingly, tin, nickel and silver, where there used to be copper. The missing copper moved to a different location, which is something that can also cause additional trouble if you have copper at a location where it's not supposed to be. And this via was damaged over the time, resulting in increasing resistance and in the end failure. And even though I found the entire oxidation part, at least from a technical perspective, quite interesting, I don't think this was such a big issue as the entire microcode being faulty, because the second problem, the real problem, is the faulty microcode requesting a too high voltage both in idle and under load, which then again increases electromigration constantly, constantly even now, and thus increases aging. I just want to switch to Igor's lab. There was a screenshot with a quite interesting statement. This microcode update, once validated and released, may not address existing systems in the field with instability symptoms. Systems which continue to exhibit symptoms associated with this issue should have the processor returned into Intel ARM8. Reading between the lines of this statement, it tells you that a part of the CPU is unstable and the microcode update will not fix the instability, which will tell you that this is like a permanent damage to the CPU. That also means that all the other CPUs are also affected and have already been yeah, exposed to accelerated aging. If right now maybe 10 CPUs, 10% 10 of the CPUs are unstable, 90% of the CPUs are fine right now, but they're like damaged, like partially damaged. They're already yeah, exposed to accelerated aging. The question is what happens in a month or like six months, one year, two years? That's especially interesting for people who will not know about that issue, at least right now, because Intel issuing a statement about the entire problem is the first and good step. Acknowledging that there is a problem and they're, that they're trying to work on it is definitely a very good step. But if all of the 13th and 14th CPUs above 65 watt are affected by this, also means that all of them have been exposed to accelerated aging, which then again means that even if you fix it with a microcode um, update, your CPU will not live as long as it usually does. With Intel CPUs, they live a very long time. And now with accelerated aging, it might not be the case. And especially if you don't figure out that you have to update the microcode. Because obviously, if you're inside this bubble, if you follow like Gamer Nexus, watch videos like this, read articles, then you will know that next month, whenever there is a microcode update, you should probably flash it. But what if you're like the average gamer that just bought a pre-built system and doesn't follow anything inside the hardware industry. He just won't find out. How is Intel going to communicate this to the average customer that doesn't have any kind of clue about his CPU that he should definitely update the microcode in order to protect his CPU? Because otherwise, what happens if he dies in two years because he didn't update the microcode? And with updating microcode, it would have lived maybe five or six years. He would just get a lot less processor for the money. And that's, that's the biggest problem I see right here. I just want to, see, want to see Intel proactively approaching all the customers of like the 13th and 14th uh, CPU. Doesn't have to be a recall, but the people have to be informed that they have to protect their CPU with a microcode update. Otherwise, the CPU might just fail much easier, much earlier than it's usually expected. And I don't think it's cool if you bought like a 4900K and you didn't know about the problem and then three years later it dies and you're maybe out of warranty. So yeah, that's, that's the part for me where something has to happen. And yeah, I already talked to Intel today quickly and they ensured me that they want to work on the entire topic. Some things are not clear yet and we will just follow, see how things evolve. All right. So much about this video about this topic. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye bye.